happy Tuesday, learners. We, welcome back, third, fourth, and fifth graders. We have another exciting English language arts lesson for you today. I am Miss Abby, and just to remind you about what we started yesterday, we have an essential question this week. What makes an explanation effective? When you're trying to explain something to someone, how do you know that you're doing a good job? What can you do to do a better job of explaining? Yesterday, we talked about using sensory details, using our senses to explain or to give information. Well, today we have something else that will help you when you're giving explanations, when you're writing explanations, or when you're getting information. That's a lot of big words. Today, we're gonna focus on the importance of numbers. So, since it's Tuesday, it's a word study day. And we're gonna talk a little bit about numbers. Just to remind you, word study means learning about words and finding patterns in the words that we read, hear, and spell. The patterns today, I hope, are so easy for you to see. Our goal today is to identify prefixes. Pre means before. I've told you before, larger words are made of smaller parts. Today, we're gonna look at that very beginning part, especially of longer words. Today, we're gonna look at different words to identify and define the pre prefix found in each word. Ready? Unicycle, bicycle, tricycle. Do you see any patterns? I notice they all have the word cycle in them. But each word has a different beginning or a different prefix. Uni cycle, bicycle, tricycle. These prefixes have meaning. Make a prediction. What do you think uni means? Sickle or cycle means circle. How many circles do you see here? One. I see that word cycle again. Cycle means circle. How many circles do you see here? By. And then over here we have cycle again. Cycle means circle. How many circles do you see here? Try. The prefix uni generally means one. When you see uni at the beginning of a word, it usually means one. By in bicycle, the prefix by means two. And try means three. There are several words that we use in English that use uni, by, and try. Sometimes they may look like long words, but when you notice this pattern, it helps you understand those words. That's what we do in word study. I have six words for you here. Unicycle, unicorn, 
uniform, unique, united, unit. What pattern do you notice in each of these words? What? Did you say that they all start with U N I? They do. Each word has the prefix or the beginning root U N I, uni, which means one. Here is an image of a unicycle, one circle. This is a mythical creature, so this looks like a real photograph, but it's an image of a unicorn. They probably put one horn on a horse, probably. Right here we have uniform, and uniform means looking the same. So these pilots are wearing a very similar uniform. You can also have sports teams that wear the same outfit. We have right here, this symbolizes unique. Unique means one of a kind. One of a kind. And in New Mexico, we have our soccer team, united. That's what it means. We all come together. We are united. One. I have five words for you here. You may know some of these. Bicycle, binoculars, bifocals, bilingual, biped. Some of these words you may already be familiar with. Do you know what biped means? Here's a hint. Bi means two. So it's at least telling you a little bit that it has to do with two. Bilingual also has to do with two because it has that prefix bi. Bifocals, it has to do with two, meaning one part of the word means two. Binoculars, binoculars, and bicycle. Each of these words has the prefix by. We may not know the other part of the word, but we at least know that two is an important part of the word. Here is a set of binoculars, two. Right here is a set, I'm sorry, not a set, a pair of bifocals. There are actually two different prescriptions in there. Have you seen people wear glasses before? This would be like wearing one pair of glasses and another pair of glasses, but in one lens. This is an ostrich. This is called a biped, meaning ped, foot. Bi means two foot. I'm also a biped. We have a bicycle and we have bilingual. This is an illustration of a child saying, hello, bonjour. Are you bilingual? Do you know two languages? I think you've already seen the pattern even in my lesson. Here are six words. Do you see the pattern? Yes, they all start with try. I think that's what you said. Tricycle, triceratops, triplets, trident, triangle, triple. What about this word trident? Do you know what that means? Maybe you know what part of the word means. I know that the first part of the word means three. It has something to do 
with three. The prefix try, when it's at the beginning of the word, gives you a hint. Three is an important part of this word. Right here, I have a set of triplets. One, two, three babies born from the same family at the same time. I have a tricycle, three circles. Right here is a trident. Do you see how there are one, two, three prongs? Usually this is connected with a sea god. And right here is a triceratops, three horns on this dinosaur. Down below, it's pretty small. What shape is that? Triangle, one angle, two angle, three angle. That's a triangle. Each of these words, three, is really important. That's why tri is at the beginning of each of these words. Where am I gonna go next? We did uni, by, try. What do you think this next prefix is going to mean? Four. We have quarter, quartet, quarantine. Quarantine. A lot of people have been in quarantine where they stay home. How does that have to deal with four? Quarter, quartet. Each of these words give you a hint that four is important to the word. Here is an image of four quarters, coins that we use in the United States. This is also an image of a quarter, a shape broken into four equal parts. Here is a string quartet. One, two, three, four string instruments. And quarantine is an old term from the 1300s. It means to spend 40 days isolated. They used to use it for sailors. When sailors were at sea, they might have been exposed to different germs. So when they got home, they had to stay home for 40 days. Right now, we're using quarantine to remember to stay safe and away from others, especially if we're feeling sick. So for your at-home activity, it's a little tricky to find words that begin with uni, by, try, or core, but that's your challenge, is to really look for words that have those patterns, those prefixes. So I have them into one, two, three, and four. I didn't put the prefix because I want you to connect the definition. If it starts right up here, by weekly, by means two. There's another, bifocals. Bi means two. Triple, tri. Tri means three. Right here, unity. Uni means one. Unity. Quarter, quar means four. I see a quartet, that also means four. The word uniform, uni means one. And triannual, I'm not sure what that whole word means, but I know it has the beginning prefix tri, which means three. So to practice word study at home, Open a book, magazine, or find a sheet of paper with a lot of words on it. 
look for words that have a prefix um, that is uni, bi, tri, or core. Go ahead and categorize them on a sheet of paper and see how many words you can find or think of or ask others around you. Have fun studying words. Up next, we have an informational text that also talks about numbers. Welcome learners, it's Mrs. Kraft, and I am back today with a story for you. And remember this week, we are working on nonfiction, which means a true story. So I have a really cool true story that's actually about somebody from New Mexico. So I'm gonna read that to you in just a minute, but I wanna review kind of what we've been working on yesterday and through this week. So remember, we're thinking about nonfiction, which means things that are true and how we can respond to them. And so yesterday, we talked about our senses. That's a great way to look at things that are true in our world. When you take a walk and you look at a flower, when you examine a bug, you can use your senses. Remember our word yesterday, one of them, was aroma. So you sniff that flower, you smell the aroma, right? The beauty of it. And you do that through your sense of smell. But you can also write about how that smells to you. So we looked at our senses. We looked at those five sensory details yesterday in our story. And then you wrote about them with Miss Abby. Today, we're gonna to take a look at numbers and how we can look at nonfiction we can make things real and come alive through numbers. They also help us understand the story. And you're gonna see in our story today that that's very true. It's gonna talk about years, so we can go back in time. It's gonna talk about some other numbers too that we'll see as we read the story. And remember, we're doing all of this under the lens of our essential question, which is what makes an explanation effective? And definitely numbers are gonna help you when you write nonfiction to make it more effective, to make, it, to make you know what you're talking about so that you can cite your sources. All right, so let's get into our story. Remember, this is a nonfiction story, but it is written as a story. So you're going to see and learn about Chester Nez and the Unbreakable Code. Chester Nez is a Navajo code talker. So we have a large native population in New Mexico. We're very fortunate. And so this is set here in the Navajo Nation. The story is by Joseph Bruchak. It's illustrated by Liz Amini Holmes. And it's published by Albert Whitman and Company. Chester Nez and the Unbreakable Code, a story of a Navajo code talker. As we read the story, I'm going to stop at certain points and point out the numbers because sometimes remember as we're reading through the lens of a writer, looking at the tricks that the writers use so that we can also translate that into our writing. I want you to be aware. Sometimes it's those details that we miss that are really important. All right, let's get started. October 1929, month of small wind. When Batoli was eight years old, the time came for him to go to boarding school. He had to leave his family, his home, and the goats and sheep he loved and took care of. He climbed into the back of the missionary's truck. You need an English name, the missionary said. Batoli's name was Navajo, just like he was. You will be Chester, the man said. Let's take a look at some of those numbers that we're seeing here. So the author starts out right away with numbers. We are looking at October, 1929. 
right there, right away, right second word of the story. And there's another number in here that may be hidden that you didn't notice right away. But remember, he was eight years old. So he might be the same age that you are when he got that into the back of his truck to go to boarding school. Did you notice those numbers? All right, so I'm going to move on. At Fort Defiance, the matrons shaved off Chester's long hair and gave him a blue uniform to wear. They made him use English, a language he'd never spoken. And when Chester spoke Navajo, the matrons washed out his mouth with yellow soap. Navajo is bad. Speak only English. Many years earlier, in the 1860s, the U.S. Army had held Navajos captive at Fort Defiance. From there, the Army forced the Navajos to go on the long walk. A journey of 300 miles into what is now New Mexico. Many people suffered and died. Fort Defiance was now a boarding school for Navajo children, but some of the youngest students had bad dreams because of the fort's history. Chester did his best to calm their fears at night. He reminded them they were not alone. They still had families back home. Did you see the numbers in this one? We have 1860s. Right here we have 1860s and we have 300 miles. So when you get very specific information like that, it really helps you to picture the, how intense it was when they hiked 300 or walked 300 miles. June 1932, month of big planting. Over the summer, Chester returned home where he could again speak the sacred language of the holy people had given the Navajos long ago. When he cared for the sheep and goats and prayed using corn pollen, he felt like a real Navajo living the right way. His heart was strong again. Being home took away the loneliness Chester felt at school. September 1932, month of half. Chester returned to school where he was again told his Navajo language was worthless. You must only use English to survive in the white man's world, the matrons said. Chester knew he might need to live in the white man's world one day. In that world, speaking English was essential, so he worked hard and did well. Chester enjoyed learning and wanted to prove his worth. He also learned to pray the Catholic way and served as an altar boy. The Catholic way was good, but so was the Navajo way. Though he spoke English in school, Chester kept his love for the Navajo people and their language. He decided to never break the ties that bound them. December 1941, month of crusted snow. Chester was in 10th grade when the school principal called the students together. The Japanese Empire attacked us at Pearl Harbor, he said. We are at war. The United States had fought the Navajo years ago, but now the United States was their country too. Chester thought about his how his ancestors stood up against enemies. He should act with the same courage, protecting his homeland was an honor. I am a warrior, Chester said to himself. I will fight for this land. April, 1942, month of big plant. Recruiters from the U.S. Marine Corps came to the reservation. We need Navajo men who speak English and Navajo, they said. The U.S. military 
needed a new way to send its secret messages. The messages were sent in code over the radio, but since anyone's radio could receive those messages, the enemy could hear them too. The Japanese had broken every American code. The Marines tried using a coding machine, the shackle, to create an unbreakable code, but the machine took too long to encode and decode messages. Then, a former army soldier, a missionary son, who had once lived on the Navajo reservation, suggested using Navajo, a language almost impossible for non-Navajos to speak. The Marines agreed to try it. Many Navajos volunteered to join the Marines, but only 29 were chosen, including Chester. They became Platoon 382. Suddenly, the language had been told to forget, they had been told to forget was important. Chester was proud he had never given up speaking Navajo. I just want to take a moment. I know there were numbers in the other pages. This one is very important because there were only 29 men right, that were chosen. Not very many people were chosen to speak Navajo. 29. Keep that number in your mind. They used English words for each letter of the alphabet. A was ant, B was bear, C was cat. Then they chose the Navajo words for each of those words. Ant was wolachi, bear was shush, cat was moasi. By the end of the first day, they had the whole alphabet. A few weeks later, three more Navajo men joined the team. Now, 32 soldiers were creating the code and learning to use it. Instead of spelling out some items in the English alphabet, they chose Navajo words to represent them. Battleship became lotso, which means whale. Bombs were ayishi, or eggs. There was a lot to remember, but Chester enjoyed what they were doing, and he had an excellent memory. September 1942. Did you catch those numbers in that page? So as a reader, as a writer, we're focusing on those numbers in the story. September 1942, month of half. After 13 weeks, Platoon 382 demonstrated their code to Marine officials. Expert codebreakers could not break it. The code was strong. The code was efficient, too. The shackle code machine took four hours to encrypt and decrypt messages. The Navajos could send and receive in less than three minutes. The Navajo language solved the Marines' communication problem. Take a note of all of those numbers. We have three minutes it took them to send, whereas it took four hours for the machine to do it. The military ordered the platoon to keep the secret code. Only commanders and officers knew about the Navajo code. Two men stayed behind to teach new Navajo recruits, while Chester and the rest of the code talkers shipped out to the Pacific. The time had come to use the code in battle. When their boat reached the island of Guadalcanal, Chester and his partner, Roy Begay, waded ashore. They dug a foxhole in the sand and they were ready. When a runner handed them their first message, they radioed it to two code talkers on the ship offshore. Bena Ali Sosi, enemy. Ana Asdoni Ato, machine gun nest. Nish Najigoda 
Tikat. On your right flank, Adil, Tahi, destroy. My apologies if I'm not saying those words correctly. Navajo is difficult, which is exactly the reason they chose it as the language for coding. Minutes after their message was received, artillery fire hit the machine gun nest. Chester shouted, you see that? Their Navajo code was working. Chester and the other code talkers sent messages on Guadalcanal for many months until the Japanese were defeated. Then they were sent to other islands in the Pacific. The soldiers saw terrible things in combat. They dodged artillery, artillery fire, witnessed explosions, and watched men die. Chester was worn out and ill, but he kept working. Every day, he prayed in Navajo using corn pollen from his medicine bag. The Navajo way gave him strength and helped him survive until he could go home. January, 1945, month of small eagle. Chester was finally home, but he'd seen too much death. He'd felt at times as if he were dead too. Chester could not tell anyone, even his family, about the Navajo code. It was still a secret. Keeping that secret brought back the loneliness that hurt so much when he first went to school. So this is a picture of how he's feeling, right? So we're using our senses in this one. He's feeling kind of alone and cold. Chester's family knew he needed help. They arranged an enemy way, a four day long ceremony to help someone exposed to the evil of war. The ceremony was also done for children returning from boarding schools like Fort Defiance. Chester knew that being at school with its military structure and harsh discipline was similar to enduring a war. The ceremony restored Chester to the trail of beauty and the right way. He no longer dreamed of war. September 1945, month of half. Eight months after Chester came home, the Japanese surrendered and the war was over. The Navajo Code had been vital to the war effort. Code talkers had served with every Marine unit. By the end of the war, more than 400 Navajos had served as code talkers. They had been told in school that their language was no good, but they had proven that was not true. The Navajo Code helped win World War II. Let's take a look at the numbers in this one also, very important. So we are, we've moved forward, right, in our dates, all the way to September 1945. So quite a few years after it started, we have 400 Navajos who were code talkers. Remember how many we started with? 29. And we ended with 400. So we had a lot of people there that knew the code, that were able to keep it secret and help in the war. That's their code book. Kept it very, very secret. Like his people who survived the long walk, Chester had never forgotten his Navajo heritage. Despite being told to give up his Navajo language and culture, he found ways to merge them with the white man's world. His spirit stayed unbroken. He kept his feet on the trail of beauty. So Chester Nez is an amazing person. Here's a picture of not of Chester Nez, but this is a picture of Thomas Begay, who was one of his friends when they went into the war. This was taken two years ago in Arizona. And our, you can see 
the cold talkers that worked in World War II are getting on in years. We don't have too many left. A number of them have already passed away. But they definitely have experiences that were very real and very, very helpful to our country. And so when you read a nonfiction book like this, you have to pay attention to those years and the numbers and the way they present in the story to help us get a handle on what happened in this really important event in our country. So we're gonna have Miss Abby come up next and she's going to work with you on a writing project using nonfiction and using numbers. So I hope you've enjoyed our story. If you'd like to do more research on the Navajo Coat Talkers, it's really important because they are, they are getting older, right? And it's really important to New Mexico. So it hits us right at home. Thank you. Hi there, writers. This week, of course, we are studying informational reading and writing. This is an important skill for life especially when you have to explain something to someone or to give information to others. Yes, sometimes your teachers will ask you to write a report, but also how many times does someone ask you to explain something? It actually happens quite often. So we hope that the skills you learned this week you can use when you're speaking writing, or just reading too. Our focus, what makes an explanation effective? Well, today we're going to try and explain an American hero. I'm going to use numbers to help me explain. Some people might say, numbers, how does that explain? Well, there are different types of numbers. In the book that we just read, there were years, ages, times, amounts, There are different types of numbers that you can use to help you better understand information. When you better understand information, you can better explain the information. Behind me, we have an American hero. Her name is Deb Holland. When I've asked students before to research an American hero, the first thing they do is they go to Google. Then they go to images. Have you ever done the same? Well, I don't think it's a bad start. It helps your brain get context. It helps you understand visuals. So right here is Congresswoman Deb Holland. However, this doesn't have enough information for me. So I'm gonna switch over to all. The first thing that comes up is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is kind of like images. It has information that is helpful, but you can't always trust it. So what I ask my students to do, and you, is to scroll down just a little bit to find something a little bit more valid. That's where we wanna get our information from. So as I scroll down, I notice that these websites seem a little bit more reputable. Reputable means the facts inside should be proven. House.gov means this is a government website. That should have facts in it that I can trust. This also has house.gov. And as I scroll down, I see better websites that will give me good information about Congresswoman Deb Holland. So when I open it up, I like to look at about pages. 
about pages will give me more information. Right here, I see a city of Albuquerque. That's because Congresswoman Deb Holland, she is our elected representative for Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sometimes when people see all of this text, they get a little overwhelmed. So what I do sometimes, I will look for numbers. I will look at what are the numbers that are posted, that are written, and what do they mean? So first off, I see the number 30. What does 30 mean? It says that her father was a 30-year combat Marine who was awarded the Silver Star Medal for saving six lives during Vietnam. Wow, her father was a hero. He served in the Marines and he saved six lives. When I hear those numbers, it gives me a better understanding of the information. Uh, as I scroll down, I'm looking for numbers, either in numeral form or in words. As I'm looking quickly, I see several years she ran her own small business. It's not a specific number, but it says for several years. As I go, I see 35th. 35th, she is a 35th generation New Mexican. 35th generation, that means her parents were one, her grandparents were two, her great grandparents were three generations for 35 generations, her family has lived in New Mexico. That is hundreds of years. That makes sense. She is a Native American and her family has been here for at least 35 generations. Wow. She became Lieutenant Governor in 2014. That's a year. In 2016, it gives lots of years, she became an honorary commander of the Kirtland Air Force Base. She was in charge of the Air Force Base. They say honorary because there was also a real commander, but when she became the honorary commander, she was able to learn about how complex the government is, the military is, and she was given lots of good experience so that she could be a great leader. As it goes down, she was one of the first Native American women to serve in Congress. Congress is the branch of the government that makes the laws. And in 2016, she was one of two Congresswomen elected only two Native American women were making the laws for our whole country. Out of over 230 Congress members, two of them were Native Americans. Her perspective is really important, especially to New Mexico. So once I've done some reading and researching, then I'm able to do some informational writing. Now, I've noticed most kids, one of the first questions they want to know, when were they born? So I had to do some additional research as well. But before you do your informational writing, you have to do note taking by reading, writing down notes, and then we can turn it into beautiful informational writing. I hope you have your notebooks ready. I have my notebook. And I'm going to use this text, Chester Nez and the Unbreakable Code, to help me. This is a published book, and I like how the author uses numbers to give information. When you give information, you're giving an explanation. How do you make that effective? With numbers. So on the first page of this book, it starts with a date, October 1929, colon, month of small wind. 
When Batoli was eight years old, the time had come for him to go to boarding school. I'm already seeing there's a year, there's an age. It starts with numbers right away. I want to do the same thing. So in my writer's notebook, I'll go to my informational writing section. Yesterday, I wrote about sunflowers. Today, I'm writing about an American hero. So for my American hero writing, the first thing I want to write is my topic. My topic is Deb Holland. She is a United States Congresswoman. She is a 35th generation New Mexican. I got these facts from the website. She is the first Native American woman elected to lead a state party. That sounds like fun, but it's a way that we talk about our leaders. She was elected to be the lieutenant governor in 2014. She is one of the first. Native American women elected to serve in Congress. Congress makes laws for all of Americans. And of course, I wanted to know when was she born? She was born December 2nd, 1960. And she was actually born in Winslow, Arizona. but she quickly moved back to New Mexico. So I have some numbered facts here. When you're reading, it's good to write down facts that have numbers in them because it helps you understand the information. Now, I'm gonna take this book and turn my facts into a story. This isn't a make-believe story. It's a real way of explaining a real person a real American hero. So I like how it starts with the month and the year. So I'm gonna start with when she was born. On December, Second, 1960, an American hero was born in Winslow, Arizona. I have a date and a year, so I'm leading with numbers. An American hero was born in Winslow, Arizona. I have my place as well, but I haven't mentioned who. Who am I talking about? Young Deborah, that's her real name. She goes by Deb also known as Deb, grew up in a military family. So I've put her name just as Deb, I need to continue giving more information. So I want to think about other numbers than I can add. Since I'm talking about her earlier, I should talk about how she's a 35th generation New Mexican.
her family traveled often, comma, as most military families do. Eventually, Deb's family made it back to the state of New Mexico. Whoops. Do you ever make mistakes while you're writing? I like to go back and reread. Back to the state of New Mexico, where 35 generations of her family had come before her. I'm trying to give an explanation of this person. Some of you may have never heard of Deb Holland before. So I wanna make sure I'm being very clear about who is this person. On December 2nd, 1960, an American hero was born in Winslow, Arizona. Young Deborah, also known as Deb, grew up in a military family. Her family traveled often as most military families do. Eventually, Deb's family made it back to the state of New Mexico where 35 generations of her family had come before her. And as I'm rereading, I'm thinking New Mexico is called the Land of Enchantment. That's the state's nickname. So let me see if I can add that back into my writing. Had made it back to the land of enchantment. Oh, I'm writing too large for these ideas. Comma, the state of New Mexico. That's a quick revision where if I find a way to make my writing even better, I can use arrows and my margin to make quick additions. That's what good writers do. Now, I haven't said one of her biggest accomplishments yet, so I'm gonna need to keep writing. As I go through my note-taking page, I did put her name. I haven't said that she's a United States Congresswoman yet. But I did say she was the 35th generation um, New Mexican, and I also put her birthday. So as you take a list of notes, mark off which ones you've used in your writing. As you notice, I've gone a little bit out of order because as a storyteller, I want my facts to flow together to make it easier to understand. Next, I'm gonna talk about her political career. So people are elected to be leaders, and that's one way that Deb Holland has really made a difference in this country. So in my first paragraph, I just give some information. In my second paragraph, I'm gonna use numbers. Numbers are gonna help me explain more about Deb Holland. In 2018, Deb Holland became one of the first, that's another number, Native American women elected 
to Congress. I'm going to go ahead and tell the story of how she got there. If you are writing informational text at home, make sure you're including lots of different types of numbers. It helps make your explanation more effective. Thank you for learning with us today at home at APS.